Hello and welcome to the Womb Centered Healing Podcast. I'm Salma Morningstar and I have Janita here with me today. Thank you so much, Janita, for joining us in the Womb Centered Healing Temple. It's so wonderful to be with you. I've, um, gosh, it's been quite a few years since we've started collaborating. Um, I don't, I've lost track, at least today, I don't have the, the, the chronological order of things sorted out. I know that I've been a guest speaker in your online temple, which you have another one coming up soon. Um, you've been a guest speaker in my online summits and on the podcast. Were you on the podcast before? I think so. We did a little preview. We did a little preview for the... Well, yeah, for yeah, the Womb Centered Healing Temple Opening Summit, we did a little preview, right. and um, it's and you also have we've done several collaborate collaborative circles, sister circles. Um, I think in in my summit and possibly other times too. And we got to meet in person when I was in London, where you live, last summer, which is just such fondness, a fond memory for me. And I hope to do so again soon and lure you to California at some point. <laughs> Come to the hot springs. So Johnita is a dear sister. Thank you so much for joining us. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the um, Embodied Shakti Summit with that Johnita is a guest speaker in that summit coming up. So we're going to talk a bit about that, and we're also going to talk about Johnita's, some of Johnita's favorite um, womb-centered healing practices, including yoni egg practices. So Johnita, please introduce yourself a little bit more and share with us um, about the Embodied Shakti Summit, Embodied Shakti Practices, and womb-centered healing. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for once again giving me the opportunity to share space with you in this online world. And yeah, I was, as you were speaking, I was going back in, in my memory and thinking, when did we actually connect? It feels like it's been a few years, and it has been actually a few years. It's been uh, around three years um, that we first connected. And and since then, we've been going back and forth with, as you said, like, you know, it's with each other's inspiration and sharing ideas, giving support, um, holding space as well. Like I and and truly seeing how we are evolving in our work with this, you know, um, same vision that we have. And I'm so excited to be part of another offering of yours because everything that you do is just so amazing and so beautifully put that it represents shakti to me to see you doing the stuff like navigating through the ebbs and flows and even like today <laughs> you know being in your moon and having your moon brain on <laughs> that is shakti to be talking <laughs> so i am i'm really honored to be part of this mm. and um sharing space and um talking about um our favorite topics pretty much <laughs> um a little bit really um, short story about myself um, for those of you who are not um, familiar with my work my name is Jonita D'Souza and I am based in London UK um, originally from India and uh, been working and practicing um, being a feminine lifestylist here working with women and um, working with women to um, assist them in incorporating um, their feminine and sensual energies in their everyday busy lives through various um, ancient practices. Just like as Sama says, it's, it's, it's part of us, uh, us remembering who we are. And so that's what I do. And um, I also offer online workshops, sister circles, sacred feminine retreats here in the UK. Um, and all of it is all about womb centered practices pretty much and i i cannot separate the shakti the womb centered healing like it's just so intertwined that um i remember when we last time started to talk about shakti for your embodied shakti summit and we got into the conversation that it is 
impossible to define that because you know shakti is everything and nothing and the moment you define it becomes false because you cannot define something which is ever changing and and mm -hmm. that is why it is so scary for us women because we have forgotten to some extent because of this busy chaotic lifestyle this this power that we have in ourselves which is our own shakti so I'm really excited to talk about it and integrate, you know, these practices of womb healing and activating Shakti into our conversation today. Yes, thank you. You know, and, and you mentioned me being on my moon cycle, you know, as, as Shakti rolls, she doesn't conform to any uh, calendar and despite our my practice of devotedly you know setting things up in such a way that i have lots of rest time and i and i don't schedule things normally on my moon time uh this this happened to be my my cycle is not like clockwork um <laughs> and and that I'm coming to moving towards menopause, and it's always been a bit variable. You know, I swing back and forth from the new moon to the full moon, and um, and so my cycle came a little bit, started a little bit late this time. So here I am thinking, uh, planning for this interview that I would have been at the end of my cycle, and now I'm on day two, and which is a day when. I have been really deeply practicing letting go of, you know, logical thinking and needing to be anywhere at a particular time or anything like that. But I had a couple of appointments today with you, with another speaker from the Embodied Shakti Summit. And I said to myself, you know what, this is obviously where I'm supposed to be at talking with Johnita and, and, and I just, when you were talking about the, the Shakti being undefinable, that really is sort of the discomfort that you that you just spoke of. And I really feel that in my body uh, as I deepen my menstrual practice of, okay, it's uncomfortable, but could I really call it pain? Or is it this deep, rich ecstasy? It's kind of like chocolate where it's bitter which is not necessarily a pleasant flavor and yet it is when it's chocolate you know so it's like this <laughs> undefinable state of being where where there's this there's all of this creative energy and yet it's going in and down and so uh and and so I could go on and on about the yeah. embodied Shakti of menstruation today. Um, yeah, like the Shakti, of course, you know, if for someone who doesn't know, of course, you can you can define it in one way or the other. Like the Shakti is the creative power of the life force energy. It's the flow that connects our body, mind, soul. Shakti is this free, wild, uh, you know, um, sensual rich mother lover creator destroyer but on the other hand the nature of the shakti is also ever evolving and it's ever expanding through each one of us mm. so that's exactly what you know you very much um, stated your experience of being in this uh, menstruation time mm -hmm. it's just ever expanding through you yeah and and what i find is that if i have any ideas about what my experience is supposed to be then that's where suffering begins <laughs> whereas if i just witness what my experience actually is and and you know stop trying to define it and listen to you know what my body is asking for what my whole being is asking for then i can just relax into the whole experience yeah ah <sighs> thank goodness <laughs> um so so i would love to hear so we, we did an interview for the embodied shakti summit and 
want to, I want to encourage listeners, if you haven't signed up for the Embodied Shakti Summit yet and want to hear um, Johnita and I and all the other wonderful speakers there in the summit speaking to these topics to Embodied Shakti in various ways. And Johnita and I totally went, went off on how undefinable Shakti is in that interview. So I highly recommend signing up. You can go to embodiedshaktisummit.com and sign up there. And, and for today, we're going to sort of weave between talking about embodied Shakti and womb-centered healing. And one of the practices that we thought we would dive into today is the yoni egg practice. And so I'd love for you to share, uh, Johnita, about your practice with yoni eggs. You know, maybe start at the beginning where, you know, what was going on for you in your life when you decided to start exploring with yoni eggs and, and what were some of the things that you noticed along the way? Yeah. Um, so the, the practice of yoni egg pretty much came to me um, after I had began exploring about my womb and my feminine energy and the entire, you know, the, the, the discovery of the whole concept of womb was a whole world in itself, you know, because we as women, um, you know, do not talk about womb as, as a normal topic, you know, unless you are pregnant. You know, that's when you look up womb in Google, all you see is like pregnant women's belly. Yeah. Pretty much that's that's what it is and that's when you actually get to know like oh okay womb i have to be pregnant to just find out more about it so that's what i had also known for a long time until i discovered like hold on each and every woman should be you know accessing this this power place you know in taoism it's called the palace of your creative power so so you know we are so disconnected and so um cold in our wombs that we have no connection. So when I discovered the womb, um, of course it was very natural to then start learning and seeing the anatomy of it and what it is like and, and, and the whole concept of pelvic floor, pelvic care, health, all of these you know, chapters began to unfold in a very natural way. And what was also happening was uh, life was bringing me circumstances, I should say. I can say right now um, um, with a big heart, but at that time, life was bringing me very painful circumstances to, to discover these topics. And um, there was a point that specifically led me to the JDEC practice where um, I felt um, very out of place with my sexuality. And this was something very um, new, new trauma for me in the sense that um, I always was very confident sexually. Um, even though, of course, you know, I was not showing off, you know, uh, growing up in India and stuff, but still I was really confident um, sexually. Just, let's just say that, you know, I didn't know much about it, but I was confident sexually. Um, so what happened is as I was exploring and doing my work of the womb and stuff and, you know, being with a partner, um, at that time, we were not married and uh, we were together for five years and um, it was a time where um, I was learning all these family practices and you know, receiving magnetism and everything was just working perfectly in my life, my business, like I was attracting clients, I was just, it was just like a whole new me. And then my husband um, one day then comes and tells me that um, he doesn't feel attracted to me anymore. So that really shocked me. And I just did not know how to handle that. Um, I literally like lost sense because I thought that, hold on, I am exploring my femininity. I am teaching this work. I am doing this. And what is going wrong? Like what happened? What happened that, and I felt like a failure in this area when you know and all of a sudden all my confidence just crashed down i i just couldn't take um these words from him and i don't know what what happened in him at the time i was i was very angry i was sad we had a lot of arguments and uh, it was just a very messy 
And I had an opportunity at that time to, to go for a priestess training. And I did not have the money for that. And I remember selling my phone, mobile phone even. <laughs> I, I wanted to go. I just, you know, took my, as much as money I could gather and I, I left for Bali. And I did my priestess training there and um, Yoni Egg practice was introduced to me there. Um, which was really interesting because we were in a circle of 20 women um, doing this initiation. And that night, I, I remember that night was um, very scary because I was not sure how it's going to be. You know, you're going to literally, are you serious that we're going to insert this, this egg, you know, in this circle, you know, of 20 women, like sitting in a circle, like how is it going to be? But we, the facilitator was really, um, she took us into a journey of, you know, activating our breasts, doing some tantric and Taoist practices, um, breathing and stuff, and led us through a, an initiation process, which was just so gentle and non-judgmental um, that it felt, began to feel safe. And the moment um, I placed, um, so she taught us a series of exercises that how I can have the yoni egg in. And as soon as my yoni egg went in, I started to cough. And I just couldn't stop coughing. And you know, it was very embarrassing because I was in my head as well. Because, oh my God, I'm disturbing the entire class and I'm coughing, I have a coughing fit. But um, later I spoke to the lady, um, my teacher, and she shared that, you know, um, like mm -hmm. how Sama, we speak about the yoni connected to the throat chakra and how, how that I was having some release. And I, I was literally, holding some pain and anger and uh, resentment of all this, the scenario that happened with my husband for like uh, an year or so that I, I got um, cough infection, chest infection for three months. I, I just was blocked here um, and I was still doing the work. So I, I was in a really confused place and I really needed someone to hold space for me to process this because sometimes, you know, Sama, like, you know, you are here right now um, and we shared, uh, so much before we started recording as well we just need someone to just see us and hold space even though we are facilitators we must never forget that and we also long for that yeah so for me that was a very beautiful moment where I could experience that and and um started learning about this process and started practicing it and um Somehow things began to again change um, between the dynamics of me and my partner then. And we eventually got married and now we are six years um, after marriage and, you know, <laughs> still together and stuff. But the, the uni egg pretty much um, was kind of um, a pain point that pleasure and um, much more vitality, I would say, in me. And I highly recommend this practice to, to women. <laughs> So can you repeat what you said just now about the yoni egg because the the sound went out for a second and I, I want to capture what you said better on the record on the recording. So you said something about the yoni egg being a pain point. Is that what you mm -hmm. said? Could you could you explain that a little bit better and, and share more about that? Yeah, so the yoni egg, um what I said is that the yoni egg pretty much helped me to, to move my sexuality from a pain point to understand pleasure and um, access more vitality and also deeper level of consciousness because you know the more we as women practice sacred sexuality we have we access this higher level of connection with the divine as well although it may sound counterintuitive according to the normal paradigm but that isn't really the case um should you experience this for yourself and see and as you were saying sama that you're feeling ecstatic in this pain <laughs> in your menstruation you know there is there is always this ecstasy and eros that we are as women part of that we never access mm -hmm. because we define a process to be painful mm -hmm. and so even though you were confident in your sexuality prior to this moment you had this you had arrived at this moment where despite this long-standing relationship with your partner despite all of your sexual confidence previous 
you got to this moment of your partner not feeling attracted to you despite all of this work that you're doing on your own femininity and learning about all of that and, and teaching them and teaching that as well you got to this point and that brought up this pain point and belief systems perhaps that you were still holding mm. somewhere inside of you mm. perhaps i'm i i'm i i don't mean to yeah to say, yeah. but I'm, I'm thinking if that were to happen to me and actually similar things have happened to me that that's, you know, that, that, that brings up in those long-term relationships, it can bring yeah. up uh, belief systems, but like I've had an experience, uh, been going through an experience where my husband um, has expressed to me that he was he for a period of time he was feeling attracted to other women not that he wasn't mm -hmm. attracted to me but that he was attracted to other women and their lives and their lifestyles that were different because you know a lot of the things that i'm doing with my life has been challenging for him like he, he doesn't i mean even though he was an entrepreneur for years now he's really liking the security of having a job you know <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So, and so he goes and he goes to his job and he meets all these women who have jobs too, you know, and, <laughs> and he wonders mm -hmm. what his life would be like with somebody who, you know, and here I am an entrepreneur, you know, doing all this stuff that he you know, I explained it to him. He he understands but it's it feels it's because of that old paradigm of mm -hmm. you know, relying on some bigger structure yeah that seems safer although for me that bigger structure is is not safe <laughs> and so i want to create structures in my own life that do feel safe and so there's it those kinds of relationship issues can be can be mm -hmm. bringing up these core belief systems with, that aren't necessarily that, that needs some massaging to weave together yeah. in a partnership and so so i'm curious to hear more about that what that inquiry uncovered for you and how the yoni egg helped you discover helped you dispel your own belief systems or energetics that might have been from a previous paradigm that wasn't serving you anymore and yeah. how how then that changed how your husband responded to you or felt about you when you shifted that energetic and then what did that what did that look like and how it how it changed your behavior and your sexuality yeah so um you said it so right sama um even though we are doing this work you know life brings us all these um now you can call the opportunities to, to learn so much more about ourselves and you know it, it shows us another dark spot another dark spot another dark area that we haven't uh, you know navigated um, and you know it, it can be um, un, a lot of unresolved emotions to um, prior to this life or ancestral and whatsoever and um, the yoni egg practice for me um, brought two things uh, to perspective First of all, um, um, a memory that I have shut down, that um, at the age of five, I was molested. So I had like shut down that information. I was so scared. I never spoke about it. I, I never did anything about it. Um, it was only through this practice, those memories came back. And it was really bad. And I, 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 I cried and cried. and. And um, I finally had the guts to, for the very first time, to share it with somebody, and I shared with my, and I shared it with my husband. That um, this is my memory that has, you know, just come up, shown up, and it is true that I have, I have just, you know, shut it down purposely in my life and never accessed that that piece of information ever again. And I realized how that was actually blocking me to to feel comfortable with him in bed, you know? So he was sensing all of that. So this was a very vulnerable piece of information for me. And secondly, well, um, can you pause there for one second? Because 
you said before that you were very confident sexually, yet at mm -hmm. the same time, somehow you weren't comfortable in bed. So how can those, here we go with the undefinable Shakti again, right? How could those two states of being, how are those two states of being happening simultaneously? Mm -hmm. How is your so, confidence expressed and how is this discomfort expressed? Yeah, so I think, as I said, that um, I was confident. I think I was thinking I was and, and he was feeling what I was ah. as well. So, you know, so there was this clash of, you know, I, I was like, what is wrong? You know, what am I doing wrong? Like, I, you know, I, I am confident, but he was sensing something. And, and you know, um, talk about being with a conscious man. A lot of women, you know, want to be with conscious men. You know? <laughs> Warning. <laughs> Warning. You might get what you ask for. <laughs> yes. Talk about that. I mean... Yes, you know, <laughs> that can be an entire topic for another discussion. <laughs> I think we've to be talked sure. about it before. <laughs> that is, you know, so, so he, was, he was sensing something mm -hmm. and he was just feeling something which he wasn't sure about and he expressed what he could express to me and that was it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I started to judge him, judge me, judge my body, judge his body and, you know, all of those things. But, um, yeah so so there was some part you know and all these things are in our unconscious and this was in my womb this this emotion was trapped in me and uh, which was not allowing us to experience a deeper level of connection um and it was really unexpected i was never aware that something like this would happen if i start the uni practice Right. But the awareness was um, a very vulnerable piece of information that um, allowed me to grieve, um, allowed me to face, and also allowed me to connect to the masculine in a, um, in a sacred way like never before. So it sounds like the confidence that you thought you had was actually sort of a, a cover-up for that deep vulnerability underneath it's sort of like you know i'm confident da, 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 putting on a show a little bit yeah <laughs> uh, i've done that <laughs> um, <laughs> when what's truly um what we truly long for in our sexual connection with people is intimacy which is not so much about performance and looking a certain way or, you know, the things that we're taught it means. What we're taught about sexuality is that you've got to look a certain way and you've got to perform a certain way, right? Whereas what we were truly that was, Yeah, that was me. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I was really confident about these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 you've you know, you probably got all those things in spades. So this I'm not attracted to you is like out of left field. You know what? I perform great. I look great. What are you talking about? When it wasn't, you know, that it was there was something underneath that, that level of intimacy, perhaps. And I, I speak from my own experience of sharing the vulnerable places. You know, I've had things like that where I used to be very um protective around my husband touching my breasts and i'd had this ever since you know i dated men and i would get really you know kind of like you know just don't just touch my breasts whenever you want to you know you have to make sure i'm ready for that you know there was a whole thing and i would always like blame it on him that he was touching my breasts when i didn't want him to you know and and make him this bad guy and this enemy and i finally made a connection about a time when i was a teenager when my adopted father at that time was studying in medical school and he decided he was going to practice a breast exam on me and it was it was really in my, it was right there out in the open my mom was there in the room it was just this like you know hey i'm going to practice and then i think it, at some point in the middle of it it turned really like this was not okay you know <laughs> and my mom started like 
saying things to him, insinuating that he was doing something bad. And, um, and I, that got embedded in my tissues that there was something bad about that. And I had never shared that with any man that I was ever with. And when I shared that with my husband and we did a whole healing ceremony around it together, it just opened up this level of intimacy where now my breasts are like, touch me, honey. Touch me. Touch me. I mean, they are always feeling that way towards him, you know, and it's never that other way anymore, you know? And so there's, there's something can, can really shift when we, um, when we drop into that intimacy that that means that we share the parts of ourselves that we've exiled and that's what really brings us closer together and so yeah. so yeah, I'm, one of you is is you know just not sharing your emotions and feelings it's it's sharing those parts of yourself that you yourself also fear mm -hmm. so a lot of them are Pretty much based on our fear or shame or guilt mm -hmm. part and when we share those with um i think with with open heart and uh, and a kind of trust that we know that we are you know handing this information to the right person <laughs> then that opens a whole new level of intimacy i'm not saying that go share this with everybody but yeah yeah so I want to know a little bit more about how the yoni egg particularly works because you said yeah. you had the experience of have you doing these yoni egg practices and then suddenly becoming aware of this memory. So yeah. how how was how is that happening? Yeah, so um so that was that was one of my first real that was one of my realization of this unique practice. The second realization that was also quite major was um how self-pleasure could be a sacred practice. And and that was something I think that kind of shifted my entire um sexual energy of you know not just being sexual for somebody or by somebody you know, with somebody, but how to actually feel sexual and spiritual at the same time. So I just want to um, give like a little background about, you know, I, I'm, I'm holding the jade egg. <laughs> so this is a um, yoni egg. This is a medium sized yoni egg. Uh, nephrite. nephrite jade? Nephrite. Uh-huh. Yeah. Nephrite jade. And it is a drilled one. So it, it goes, uh, comes with a thread. So pretty much we insert the, the bigger part, the, the, the thicker part in our yoni. So this practice pretty much comes from um, ancient China. It's kind of dated 5,000 years ago. And um, it was developed by somebody called Yellow Emperor. Um, he was this, uh, if I have to say, it, a very cool emperor uh, who was kind of very modern at those times. He wanted his empire to be, you know, um, really flourishing so what he did was that he he created committees of people for different um um i would say for different categories and aspects of um his his community pretty much because he wanted to excel in every single aspect of his uh, reign uh, his rule so he created committee for um herbal medicines the silk industry the agriculture what he did was um, he, he um, chose the best people in his uh, community to be part of these committees and, and get um, develop best practices so they can literally thrive with the herbs, with the silk, with the agriculture. And since the Taoist teachings believe that sexuality is also part of spirituality, so he decided to have a sexual team as well that could develop like best sexual practices ever that can help um, easy access to um, spiritual um, higher levels of spirituality. So he he kind of um, hired three uh, three women who who's, uh, who studied and uh, developed this sexual practice, and um, and hence this um, jade egg practice was born. And at that time in China, uh, jade was considered a very <laughs> <laughs> jade it was considered like a very um precious um stone 
just like um, gold or more than gold. So I just want to see if my screen is working. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so, so jade was the most precious stone at that time, and which is why the, the ladies began to practice with the jade stone. And um, they developed a practice which then um, they presented to the king, and they said that, oh, this is the best practice that can help you connect with your spiritual essence. But the thing is, you can't do it yourself. You will have to have your queen do it for you. Because, and that was um, pretty much the practice and it was kept to the royal families anyone who leaked this information was killed because they wanted the queens to have access to the best practices so that they they look young they have better you know um, vitality hormonal production they are good at insects and through um conscious uh, communion the men could access that uh, level of spirituality so if you can talk about heroes gammas uh, kind of process was developed um, so that's where it comes from but the interesting thing what they I, research uh, I want to just insert a, a suspicion that I have around this story is that the women didn't just come up with that right then when the emperor paid them for the best sexual practices they'd been mm -hmm. practicing that all along uh yeah practicing jade egg and other various you know probably. Isis. Yeah. yeah and yeah. and it, this is the it, this emperor is named as the origin of the jade aid practice because mm -hmm. uh, we have to have some emperor and that's when the men started to catch on to you know and take ownership like the yeah part of the story said now now that he paid these women to come in and share this this feminine practice now anyone besides the queen who is practiced discovered to be practicing it is now in danger for their life so i would say i would say that this this practice predates that particular emperor and and i would say that i wouldn't give him credit for the, for promoting that practice at all i would say that let's give credit to the women who then suffered through his persecution and um kept it alive and now we're rebirthing these practices for every woman that you don't have to be the the queen of some emperor in order to be able to practice this for yourself so i just wanted to reframe that story for us a little bit because um it is it is correct what you're saying because as i said like it is from the time of isis mary magdalene is been known uh, for um the yoni and practices as well so um the, the emperor pretty much deployed these women to go get information and bring best practices because he wanted to be the best um i think um the the citation of these um like the process was developed, written and circulated through Taoism in ancient China through his name and also brought to the West in only in the 1960s by Manta Chia, uh, who is a big uh, Taoist um, uh, teacher. And, um, and that's how this, this process is, uh, I mean, this, this, this um, whole feminine practice is kind of, you know, becoming popular and popular. And, um, even the media these days i mean recently there were some um posts by um some celebrities you know kind of making fun of this practice some doctors saying it's kind of like nonsense practice you shouldn't go for it and you know there are it's still kind of forbidden in one way or the other through the patriarchal system and i was banned from facebook <laughs> for, for doing this class <laughs> There is an element of, you know, forbidden uh, patriarchy, forbidding this feminine practice. Yeah, right. it's still going on <laughs> in many ways. And so I, I'm really curious about your experience of how the practice got you in touch with these forbidden memories that even that you had inside of you that were limiting your intimacy. Yeah, so um, one of the practices um, to the pre jaded practice is to um, connect with your yoni and um, and connecting with your yoni of course it requires uh, some kind of breathing practices some kind of movement practices some touch but this particular um, practice involves yoni gazing so 
So pretty much just uh, for one week, I, I sat and I just um, lit a candle. I gave myself some time and um, five minutes of timer. I kept the timer because I just couldn't bear the sight that I'll be doing this at that time because I was still uh, not interested or scared. Um, and for seven days, I just stared at my yoni. I had this big mirror. I just sat with a candle and I just stared and stared and stared. First day I couldn't do even five minutes. Second day I cried a lot. I uh, had a lot of judgment on uh, how does she look. Um, she is not as uh, how the uh, how the Google shows for white women. Uh, you know, I'm brown. And all of those kind of you know, color, shape, hair, there was a lot of judgment. And, and, and I think it required me to commune to the Yoni in a, in a way that I have to start seeing her and, and uh, seeing and seeing and seeing, which kind of brought, you know, um, tears of grace and gratitude on the third day. That was a deeper level of, like, she always wanted to speak to me, but I, I didn't see her that way you know i always saw her as the sexual organ and inform taking information this is what the you know anatomy is as i was learning anatomy but really seeing that she has a she has something for you you know and she's there for you and and she is this you know, so, so the yoni is called pretty much the jade fountain and yoni itself is, means you know the gateway to sacred portal yeah so connecting to her in a spiritual way kind of made me use this process in a very a spiritual way. So I would set up a ritualistic time, like light a candle, you know, even um, pray with my egg, uh, infuse my intentions, sometimes even sleep with it. So it took me a lot of time to even carve um, space for this practice very intentionally and through um, breath, movement and sound, then, you know, asking her if she's ready for this practice. Uh, you know, to, to be ready to be inserted because I did not want to violate another boundary again to really listen and allow her to speak. And a lot of journaling, a lot of crying, a lot of, um, and crying was actually kind of like how you were describing this ecstatic pain. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like crying of trauma, but it was just something really opened up. And this is a practice that each woman should gift herself. And um, we, we also did a ceremony called Yoni Puja, where we actually did, um, um, we actually worshipped the yonis of the women in the circle. So with flowers, with um, uh, rose water, and there was like whole ceremonial things. So it was really vulnerable that you had to literally sit showing your yoni and other women would just come worship, just like the ancient days. So these kind of powerful practices um, taught me that there is more to the yoni than just the sexual essence you know there's deep level of spirituality and and you can begin to listen to her she is she is just like your heart you know you can begin to listen to her beat and and how she feels how she responds to situations and 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 um how she wants to speak what she wants to speak and all of that so um, so all of this was a very spiritual experience. It turned out to be a very spiritual experience. And then feeling the pleasure, you know, connecting the pleasure to the chakras and, um, and um, dedicating it to the Father Sky, Mother Earth, and, you know, and being this channel of this pleasure and stuff kind of like literally shifted my sexual energy to um, a different level. And that, I think, kind of helped me to reintegrate back to um, this woman that I was becoming then. And so it sounds like that as you became more intimate with yourself, with your own yoni and, and your own spirit, really, through that portal, that, that that opened up a new availability for you for a level of intimacy that it sounds like your partner was was probably not maybe not even being able to articulate that that's what he was yeah feeling yeah. he wanted and that's that's what he wanted to move towards and so did you notice along the way that 
that his attraction to you began to return? Do you know, do you remember any particular moment when that started to, to shift? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, definitely when I was um, back after six weeks home, um, we had this conversation and definitely something has shifted. I think um, he somehow realized that um, also that um, he did not mean what he said. And I was like, what? I went all the way to Bali and <laughs> you did not mean what you said. Like, you know, so there was a deeper level of um, communication, understanding and, um, and a consolation to each other. I think the bonding was, um, it was like sweet symphony. Um, there are not many words that I can explain because it was just happening. Like we just got back, like nothing had ever happened mm. between us, mm -hmm. which was really nice and um, interesting. You know, like when even when we made love, like it was interesting. This is um, very uh, <laughs> intimate conversation, but I can share that um, he was able to feel my 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 muscles, my pelvic floor in a much different way like he was like oh my god I can sense them and I was like yeah I've been working on you know my pelvic floor muscles through the jade egg and and I could do this and squeeze and things like that and he was like oh my god what is that oh yeah <laughs> so that's like <laughs> that's like a bonus <laughs> that's a bonus right but yes a bonus yeah. <laughs> yes yeah. well, I, I've noticed similar things that when I practice various energy things especially during sexuality my husband definitely notices so <laughs> so and that's a, that really um nourishes our intimacy to be to have that kind of involvement that kind of awareness and sensitivity together and to share that that definitely nourishes the intimacy and i just feel it's so beautiful that your partner even though he he didn't know how to articulate what he was feeling and even though maybe it was clumsy and maybe it, maybe it was painful that that something in him you know required him to speak out that he was feeling that something wasn't quite right and that that inspired you to inquire in yourself what what was it and to dive deeper into your own connection with yourself and i just would like your story to inspire anyone listening who is having challenges in their intimacy in their sexual relationships in their partnerships to if, if we can just deliver that one piece that perhaps when things become challenging, if instead of um, deciding that the other person is wrong, even if they are clumsy and they are saying it in a way that might be hurtful, that if we can take it as an opportunity to look inside ourselves, not looking for who's wrong, but looking for how can I grow? How can I get to know myself? How can I give myself the intimacy and love that I'm wishing my partner would give me, for example? And my experience is when I do that time and again, if mm. I am giving myself that intimacy and love and care, if I'm feeling attracted to myself because I'm gazing in the mirror and I can see beauty, and, and it's not just overwhelmed by the pain and the and the stuff I'm avoiding and my own judgments, like some of the things that you described, right? If I can really gaze at my yoni and just feel the beauty, or gaze at my whole body and feel my own beauty and express that, then that's the only expression I get from anyone else, because there's there's no room for anything else and even if somebody did i it wouldn't bother me because i know different that's okay they can think what they want to think about me and so it's like me and my gray hair you know i i uh, there's lots of sisters that that i connect with that tell me i'm so brave that i'm willing to not dye my hair and there's another community of sisters like the midwives and the herbalists where gray hair is actually people want to have gray hair sooner so that they're taking 
seriously, professionally sooner so that we can like stand the cruel wise woman thing and that people will listen you know I, I i study with this one woman who started to being a midwife at age 15 and she was always feeling less than when she when she was serving families that were much older than her until she started to get her gray hair she wasn't dying of one of those gray hairs ever because she wanted to step into the wise woman uh role you know in her in her life and so for me, it's like if I can embrace and love everything about myself, then I just become more and more attractive to my husband. You know, like I'm getting older, I put on weight. I used to be super skinny. Now I have quite a belly. And my husband just sits there and rubs my belly like it's this magic lamp and some genie's going to pop out, you know? I mean, he just loves it, you know? And even if I might have moments where I'm like, no, I'm not all skinny and flat bellied like I used to be. Do I need to do something about that? And then, you know, he's rubbing my belly like, you know, and I'm like, I guess I don't need to do anything about that, you know? <laughs> so, so I just want to encourage everyone listening to receive this beauty of your story Johnita and my little pieces of my story I've added to it that we can love ourselves mm -hmm. as we want to be loved and that that's really the 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 best approach and if we can thank that emperor for his role in bringing that message to us right now even though <laughs> Uh, but really, it's the women who's kept that that these practices alive, uh, despite the persecution, despite the taking of ownership by by the patriarchs. You know, it's like okay, yes, write it down. Wonderful. <laughs> you know, one <laughs> <I'm> good thing. <laughs> So thank you so much for sharing, Johnita. And um, I just want to remind you all that if you want to hear more from Johnita and I, you can join the Embodied Shakti Summit at embodiedshaktisummit.com. And if you wanted to connect with Johnita um, about more of her offerings, you can connect with her. Would you share with us where the best place to get a hold of you might be? Um, yes. So on my website, exploringfemininity.com. So I think you will provide the links there. So um, hop onto the link. There are a lot of free resources. Um, I also run a Exploring Femininity Facebook group. Um, yeah, join me there and we can continue this journey together. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, Johnita's Facebook group and Johnita's email newsletter is a constant source of inspiration and sisterly support for me. So I encourage anyone listening to please reach out to uh, Johnita's Johnita for to participate in those things as well. So thank you so much, Johnita. And any last words of wisdom or insight to close out our time today? Um, yeah, <laughs> so as we started from the ever-changing, ever-expanding definition of Shakti, it's also the same for all the, all the struggles and all the obstacles that you may be feeling right now. And as Sama also very beautifully kind of summarized the entire conversation that if there is any struggle, challenge, See what is the gift that you can give to yourself through that, because on the other side, it will be one of the most fulfilling journey for you. So just be courageous and and follow follow your follow your womb's calling. <laughs> be courageous and follow your womb's calling. May all of us receive that message as many times as we need to to fully live it. Thanks again, Johnita, and thank you all for listening. That's all for now. Until next time.